Everybody, I said, Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I welcome everyone to this glorious event, the ministers, professionals conference, and I pray that the Lord Himself will impart every life, every minister, for a greater, better, higher ministry in Jesus' name. The Lord will reveal His mind to us. We receive and take the word as He reveals and will work on everything. We'll not be hearers only, we'll be doers of the word in Jesus' name. And the blessings of doers will be upon everyone. Upon me. God bless you. Father, we well, thank you for this moment. We well, bless your name for what you started doing already. And we pray that here in our Alpha location, Iola, Adamawa stage, Nigeria, I pray that it will reach to the rest of the world. Amen. And you impact every life, every minister, every worker, every professional, here and everywhere in Jesus' name. Amen. Lift everyone up. Amen. Impact your very life and anointing upon everyone. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we we'll pray. Amen. And everybody shout, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to Joshua chapter 1. And I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. Joshua chapter 1. Reading from verse 1. Look at this. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, in verse 2, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead, departed, gone now. Therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all the people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. The Lord had called Moses to bring out the children of Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness and into the promised land. They were now at the border of the promised land. They had come out of Egypt, part one of the calling of the ministry. When God calls us, he makes us to understand that we're there for something, we're to do something. We're not in the ministry just for the position. We're not in the ministry just for the nomenclature. We're not in the ministry just to be called a pastor, a minister, an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, and we're not in the ministry for just the title that we bear, the position that we hold. We're in the ministry to do something, and something definite, and something specific. And so Moses had fulfilled the calling of the Lord upon his life, and he got them through the wilderness. But in the case of Moses, his ministry was filled with the miraculous, with the supernatural, and the great things were done. But I want you to understand that the ministry of Moses did not just end in getting them out of Egypt, passing them through the wilderness and coming to the very border of the promised land. He gave them the word of the Lord. And that word of the Lord had remained from that time 
until this time and until the end of the age the end of our world the end of our dispensation that word will remain now if Moses had brought water out of the rock if Moses had brought manna by his prayer by his intercession for them had brought manna from heaven if the word had not been reaching his ministry would have terminated at the point of his death but because of the word is the one that God used to give us the book of Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy because of that the work had remained until this time we want to do a lasting ministry a lasting work and you'll find that from that time of uh, Moses uh, when he had gone on and departed is quoted in Joshua is quoted in Judges is referred to in the Psalms is referred to by every prophet that came to the land of Israel and referred to by the kings in the New Testament Jesus Christ referred to him Mark uh, Matthew Mark Luke and John they all referred to him Acts of the Apostles they referred to him and in the epistles is referred to unto revelation is referred to the point is let's think about the work the lord has given us to do so that it does not terminate with the point at the point where we are and then when we are gone will not be remembered by anybody or with anything now the lord said moses my servant is dead that word dead it means he has departed actually when a minister when a man when a man when he departs from this world he changes accommodation he changes his residence he's no more here but he's over there and he's still very much alive so let's understand when a believer a real child of god when he dies he departs he goes to another residence it's being a residence here on earth now is in residence over there in heaven jesus said let not your heart be troubled believe in god believe also in me that in my father's house are many mansions if you are not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you here you have a place you are living on earth and when you get over there there's another place you are living is higher is greater is brighter is a uh, more much more peaceful than where we are here and so he said Moses my servant is dead he said now therefore arise now you have a work to do Moses had passed the baton on to Joshua he was now to arise and do something and complete the work it wasn't starting afresh as if you know nothing had been done but is to build on what Moses the servant of the Lord had done is to move on from the place he now took over as the minister of God as we come to minister in the church we're not starting afresh we're not rewriting the Bible that has been done already we're not a uh, were not uh, bringing a new doctrine that has been done already Moses had done the foundational work and now arise it's not going to get back to Egypt and repeat the story again and bring them water out of the rock and get them through the Red Sea and give them manna and give them all that Moses had done no it's to continue from where Moses had left the same thing as we come to the ministry the foundation has been laid already and now we come to continue where we have taken over today I'm talking to you as an introductory message today I'm talking on the divinely transformed minister for a triumphant ministry a ministry something to do a ministry with message and ministration a ministry that we're coming to the lives of the people and we're impacting their lives for something very definite in their lives if we have got something definite we're able 
able to pass on that divinity to other people a triumphant ministry not a trodden down ministry not a trampled ministry it's not a ministry that you know every day can hurry will come and trample on it is a triumphant ministry the lord is calling us to if we're going to have <clears throat> If we're going to have a triumphant ministry, we ourselves must be transformed ministers. That's why we're talking about a divinely transformed minister. It's not a person by self-effort, by self-will, by turning over a new leaf by himself, transforming himself. It's a person who had God and experience with God and divinely in a powerful way by the mighty power of god he had been transformed and he's become a minister a man then a minister a son then a servant a person who has now tasted the power of the lord in his life and the glory of the lord in his life being transformed the lord can then use him as an instrument of transformation in other people's lives the divinely transformed minister for a triumphant ministry we're looking at uh, three points uh, here today number one we're looking at the calling and characteristics of a transformed a, a transformed minister trustworthy minister number two is the companionship and communion with a trusted mentor number three uh, the conviction and consistency of a transparent model let's look at number one when you see joshua this time uh, as our text to launch into what the lord wants to reveal unto us we're looking at number one number one uh, is the calling and the characteristics of a trustworthy minister we divide this to three parts number one we have the true conversion and separation unto the lord true conversion and separation unto the lord number two at the time tested consecration and submission for life not just for a week or for a month or for the period we're here together for life until the end of his life the time tested consecration and submission of a minister of a leader of a professional of a child of god and that transformation and that consecration that submission is for life number three the tenacious courage and steadfastness in leadership if there's anything that describes the leader is the tenacity of purpose and the tenacity of the pursuit and he is tenacious in what he does and for that to take place he must have courage he must have conviction he must have confidence he must have the grit that is the strength and the power to move on tenaciously without any hindrance and without any limitation at all the tenacious courage and steadfastness in leadership let's look at number one there number one there we're looking at uh, number one, we're looking at uh, the true conversion and separation to the Lord. We're coming to Numbers chapter 14. In Numbers chapter 14, here we meet Joshua. Well, maybe if you are reading the Bible, we've met him in Exodus before. Exodus, uh, uh, that's chapter 17. But now we meet Joshua and he describes his life describes its conversion describes the change describes the transformation that came within him upon him and through him we could see that change and that conversion or transformation in numbers chapter 14 reading from verse 14 numbers chapter 14 verse 14 it says sorry chapter one chapter 14 verse one chapter 14 of numbers verse one it says and all the congregation that is the congregation of the children of israel all the congregation 
congregation lifted up their voice and they cried and the people wept that night what had happened is they had sent spies to the land of promise and the spies came back and they told a bad story they gave an evil information. They said, yes, we've been to the land. The land is flowing with milk and honey. But the people there, they are giants of the people. And those people, they swallow up, they eat up the people of the land. They said, we're not able. That's why the people lifted up their voice and they cried and they wept all through that night. But we're told in verse 4, in verse 4, it tells us and they said one to another let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt that was the kind of the idea of the multitude the mob the people that felt there's no way forward they didn't have faith in God they didn't have confidence in God they didn't have the tenacity to go on and they didn't know God has said and because God has said is going to fulfill everything he has said because he's a God that cannot lie. He's a God that does not change. He's a God that whatever he has purposed to do and promised to do and planned to do is going to do that. Because of that, they wanted to choose a captain so that they can go back to the land of Egypt. And they were told in verse 5, in verse 5, then Moses and Aaron fell upon on their faces is before the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Then in verse 6, in verse 6, we're told that Joshua, the son of Nun, there's a man, there's a modem, we're looking at the minister, we're looking at, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which one of them that searched the land, they wrench their clothes. Then in verse 7, we're told, and they speak unto, the, unto all the company of the children of Israel saying the land which we pass through to search is an exceedingly good land. You can see the difference, you can see the change, and you can see their own understanding of the promise of God. It shows they were really converted. They were changed people. They were transformed people. They were not like the rest of the people. When we're converted, we become changed. Change in what we see changed and transformed in how we interpret the conditions around us changed and transformed from uh, the multitude the multitude they are in this way they are gullible and they just soak in uh, everything uh, as ten of the spies said no we are not able the, go the gullible uh, people in the land the gullible people in uh, Israel mixed multitude they began to cry they already accepted they could not they forget the word of God they forget the promise of God they forgot the calling of God upon them but those who are converted they have a different heart a different mind a different interpretation a different way a different direction in life a different lifestyle a different language a different communication that shows from caleb to joshua joshua to caleb those two they were different and if you are really converted and before you can be called into the ministry to convert other people you yourself must be converted if you are really converted there will be a change in your heart the bible says if any man be in christ as a new creature old things have passed away and behold all things have become new. Your language will be different from the language of the world. Your appearance will be different from the appearance of the world. Your mindset will be different from the mindset of the world. And your pursuit and your plan will be different from the pursuit and the plan of the people of the world. You will not stand with the crowd. You will not abide and remain with the crowd. You'll come out of the crowd and 
you will make your conviction known. You will not be a hidden Christian, a hidden believer, a hidden minister. We don't even know where he stands. We don't know where she stands. There was no doubt in the mind of the whole congregation. They knew where Joshua stood. They knew where Caleb stood. And if you are like that, you are converted, you are born again, you are a child of God. The Spirit of God has impacted your life. We will know where you stand. Anywhere you go, in your office, in your house, in your home, in the community. We will know this is where he stands. He has come out. Out of the crowd, out of the multitude, and the spirit that leads him and guides him is different from the spirit of the world. He now accepts the word as it is. He accepts what God has said as it is. Yes, we see the giants there, but we see a greater God, the God who has impacted our lives and who wants to impact the lives of other people. Look at verse 8 there. In verse 8, it says, if the Lord delight in us, they concentrated on the Lord. What's the concentration? What's the focus of a minister who is converted? He concentrates on the Lord. We have news here and news there. That one is happening. That one is happening. He doesn't concentrate on that. He concentrates on the Lord and the word of the Lord. Have you heard? Yes, I've heard. What did you hear? I hear Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. She shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. And that's not what I mean. I mean, have you heard? I said, yes, I've heard. What have you heard? Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I know what they are asking for. Have you heard this? Have you heard this? Have you heard that? Have you heard that those who came from the land of promise? This is the story they are telling. What I've heard is what God has said. What have you heard? I said, what have you heard? You'll hear what God has said. And when you hear what God has said, and you believe in what God has said, He'll fulfill it in your life in Jesus' name. That's why they said, if the Lord delight on uh, in us, He says, then He will bring us into the land and give it to us a land which flows with milk and honey. Look at verse 9 there. In verse 9, only rebel not against the Lord. Have you noticed there's something in uh, when you become converted and you become born again and then you tell the people in the world, your neighbors, your uh, companions uh, before and everyone, office workers, everyone, and you tell them uh, only rebel not against the commandment of the Lord. Have you noticed that when you say that, you come back to the office, you come back to your community, you come back everywhere and you are telling them rebel not, sin not, repent of your sin believe on the Lord Jesus Christ it's difficult for a person like that to backslide when you have opened your mouth and you have told other people around you and you say rebel not and you say no secret it will damage your life alcohol it will damage your life going from woman to woman man to man will destroy your life once you are saying it every time and you are telling the people every time it will be difficult for you because everybody looks at you now that's a pastor, that's a preacher that's an evangelist, that is you know whatever they want to call you and you will not be able to go back to them but if you say you are converted, if you say you are born again, you are a preacher on your pulpit, we never hear the word of repentance from you or the word of righteousness from you or you are just a neighbor and your neighbors never hear that this is the change that has taken place. And you're not telling them that this is the way to go. What keep them in? When temptation comes, after all, you're a hidden disciple. After all, you're a hidden believer. After all, you're a person that nobody knows where you stand. It will be easy for you to backslide. But by the grace of God, you will not backslide. Let me hear Adam our state. Amen. 
only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. You know, when you're going about and you're saying, fear not, fear not, fear not, any news you hear, fear not, any news you hear, fear not, it will be difficult for you yourself to be afraid because they know that this is the center of your message. This is the emphasis of your message. You see, there's a God in heaven. He takes care of us. There's a God in heaven who will not fail. You wake up in the morning and the first thing you meet, you're saying, good morning, sir, fear not. Good morning, madam, fear not. And when you spread that all about fear not, fear not, fear not, there will be no fear in your life. I said there will be no fear in your life. When we counsel people and we counsel them aright and we're telling them all those things you are hearing from there and they're filtering in, fear not. Then you yourself, by the grace of God, the strength of the Lord will hold you up. Will hold me up. I come to tell you, fear not. Tell the person by your side, fear not. There's nothing to fear. And then it says, it says for their defense is departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. The Lord is with us. That's the language of a converted soul. That's the language of a transformed life. That's the language of a person who is totally separated unto the Lord. And he knows the Lord is always with him. The Lord will be with you. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Once your mouth keeps on saying, fear not, fear them not, your heart will register that. And every kind of fear in your heart, every kind of fear in your spirit, every kind of fear in your soul, everything will vanish away. And amen. We're looking at number two here, number two here, the time-tested consecration and submission for life. Now, time-tested, time-tested. You know, when we say time-tested, it means the wind will blow a period of time. The rain will fall a period of time. Circumstances will move here and there a period of the time. A time-tested consecration is a consecration that whatever the period of time, whatever the passage of time, whatever the pain, and whatever things may be happening, any time, any period, that consecration is still there because it is time-tested consecration. Now, what do we call consecration? Consecration for the children of Israel. Those children of Israel, they were very much familiar with the sacrifices of an animal. They at the altar. Somebody who wants to sacrifice that animal will bring it to the priest and they lay it on the altar. Head, legs, stomach, tie, everything on the altar. They will not take anything away from that animal. And the priest said, why are you taking that away? And he says, for private use. And then he comes again. They have not totally burnt the sacrifice of the Lord. And he cuts a part of that. And he say, what are you, why are you doing that? For personal use. And then he comes again. Why are you taking that away again? He kind of mutilates the sacrifice. They will not do that in Israel. And when we say to consecrate, it means to offer. It means to give. It means to bring your sacrifice, your heart, your mind, your soul, your past, 
your presence, your future. It means to lay it on the altar of the Lord. And you are not taking part of that away and say, Lord, I give you my life, but I take this one away for personal use, for private use. I take this one away for I have a peculiar need. I'm taking that away. No, consecration means that everything who you are everything what you've got everything is laid down that's what we learned about joshua he had consecration not only that time tested consecration not only that submission to the lord for life submission to the lord for life once we met joshua in the bible in Exodus, and then you find out his life going on and going on and going on. His submission to the Lord was very clear, very plain. He wasn't just submitting and taking it away, submitting on Sunday, and then Monday through Saturday, he takes that off. Or maybe during uh, you know, the rainy season, he says, I cannot keep on giving this to the Lord. Please excuse me. I need this that I give you. I'm taking it back for private use. Dry season, Lord, I'm sorry for this, but I have to come back and uh, you know, take some something away from what I've sacrificed is submission to the Lord for life, all through your life, whatever. That's what we're learning, that if we're going to serve the Lord, our consecration, everything we lay on the altar is a time-tested consecration and is total submission to the Lord for life. And let's come to uh, Deuteronomy there, chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 21. Deuteronomy chapter 3. And we're looking from verse, at verse 21. It says, I, and I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, I commanded Joshua at that time and Joshua was still available and Joshua was still there and Joshua was following implicitly without taking any consecration away saying thine eyes have seen all that the Lord your God he was born again in our New Testament language the Lord your God he belonged to God the Lord your God it was not a property of the devil and then the property of God and then God and the devil putting him pulling him uh, to side you come this way you serve the devil a little and serve God a little the Lord your God he was the Lord is God all the time if you are a real child of God that is what we say about you if you are really giving to the Lord and submissive to the Lord that is what we say about you it's not uh, you know the Sunday Sunday that are prima and the Sunday Sunday aspirin the Sunday Sunday believer the Sunday Sunday convert all the days of your life every time everywhere in every way possible you are totally committed and totally submissive unto the Lord time tested consecration and then it says you have seen your eyes have seen what I've done unto these two kings and it says so shall the Lord do unto all the kingdoms whither thou passes look at verse 22 in verse 22 it tells us there it says ye shall not fear he had been telling other people to fear not and now the Lord was telling him through uh, Moses his mentor through Moses his leader through Moses the minister of God that thou shalt not fear but it says Thou shalt not fear them, for the Lord your God, he will, he shall fight for you. The Lord will go with you. 
throughout life, it will be with you. And what we learn of Joshua, that's what we learn about ourselves, that we too, as people of God, we too, as children of God, we abide faithful unto the Lord. It tells us in Joshua chapter 11, I'm reading to you from verse 15, Joshua chapter 11, we're looking at verse 15, the Lord commanded, the Lord has commanded, and Moses, Moses his servant, as he commanded, so did Moses, and then he say he commanded Joshua and so did Joshua. Can you say that? The Lord commanded Moses and as the Lord commanded Moses so he did and he commanded Joshua and as the Lord through Moses had commanded Joshua exactly that is what he did. Look at that verse verse 15. It says let nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. That's what I said long time life time time tested consecration and submission to the lord for life it tells us in romans uh, chapter 6 and i'm reading from verse 17 here romans chapter 6 reading from verse 17 it says but god be thanked for the believer god be thanked for the convert god be thanked for the one who has submitted his life to the lord and it's a lifetime life long time tested conversion consecration and submission to the lord it says god be thanked the god God, a father in heaven, the God who has transformed our lives, the God who has changed our lives, it says, God be thanked that she was servants of sin. We were sinners, we had not been born again, when we didn't know the Lord, when we didn't know the Lord in our heart, in our language, in our mind, in every pursuit, in the thing that we did, it said, we were sinners, we were servants of sin. It says, but ye have obeyed the, the heart from the heart, the form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. That's conversion. That's conversion and that's consecration. We submit ourselves to the Lord. We give ourselves to the Lord totally and completely, wholeheartedly, spirit, soul, and body, time, and skill, everything submissive unto the Lord. And we do that for life, all the days of our lives. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, it says, Being then made free, the one who called us, and the one who converted us, the one who transformed us, the one that changed our heart, our spirit, our soul, and the one that turned us from following the way of darkness, and we're now following the way of light, it says, he has made us free, free from sin, he became the servants of righteousness not one day in the week you become the servants of righteousness not one week in the month you become the servants of righteousness not just for periods of time but a time-tested consecration and a submission for life that whether it's in the private or in the public or whether it's on Sunday or weekday, whatever time is this, the Lord has made us free, set us free. And the things He set us free from, we take away from our side because now we are free. And we live the life of a person that is free from sin, free from the old life, and free from anything, everything we were at addicted to in the past because of the time tested consecration and that submission for life we're coming to number three now number three we're looking at the tenacious courage and steadfastness in leadership Joshua has now come to leadership you have now come to leadership Leadership in that little community. Leadership in that moderate church assembly. 
leadership in that stage, leadership in that region, leadership anywhere, everywhere the Lord has called us to and in such leadership, in such calling, in such ministry, you need courage. Not with any courage. Today I'm courageous. And then tomorrow, I don't know where I am. But courageous every time. Courageous with tenacity. Courageous all the time. Courageous in every situation. There are some situations you had known of before. And when the Spirit of God abides within, you are courageous. After all, you were tested yesterday, last week, last month, last year, and you've gathered experience now in things familiar. In things where you've overcome before, you're courageous. But there are some new things that happen that you have not experienced before. I never saw this before. I never saw Jericho walls before. I never saw Jordan before. I never saw the confederacy of these uh, kings of the Canaanites before. It's new. And even though it's new, you are courageous. That's leadership in things past in things present, in things new, in things you've confronted before, in things you never knew that shall come to man, you have tenacious courage that is necessary in leadership. And then you have steadfastness in that leadership. You're just moving on. You don't say I'm tired. You don't say I'm crumbling. You don't say I cannot find my way again. You don't say where is the road? Where is the road? The road is always there for the one who is steadfast in leadership. We're coming now to Deuteronomy chapter 31 and I'm looking at verse 7. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and we're looking at verse 7. It says and Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel and then he said be strong and of a good courage. Moses understood. Leading the children of Israel the mixed multitude, all those people, it demanded courage. Just watch Aaron Lodge when Moses went to the top of the mountain. And before Moses came back, the people had backslidden. And then Moses said, Aaron, what happened? He said, you know the people, they be ready to stone me and I cannot take that. He didn't have the courage a leader ought to have. He knew the right, but he did the wrong. He knew the way, he went the other way because of the lack of courage. Tenacious courage. The bulldog and the courageous leader that holds on and he says, this is the way. There's no other way. Christ is the way. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And whatever wind may blow, whatever thing may happen, things familiar, things so familiar. He has the tenacious courage. And so Moses told Joshua, and he said, be strong. What does that mean? Develop your muscles, not really. Develop your legs and your bones and be able to run, not really that. He's talking about being strong in your spirit, being strong in your mind, being strong in the inner man. That if you're going to be a leader, you are converted, praise the Lord. You have conviction, praise the Lord. You must have courage, courage in the inner man. Courage in your soul and courage in your spirit. Be strong and of a good courage. Good courage. That's bad courage. Somebody sees a vehicle, you know, at top speed and he says, Well, he will stop for me. And in any case, I'm courageous. And then he runs in front of the vehicle. That's bad courage courage bad courage and somebody sees an ocean very deep cannot swim and he just wants to use bold face before the people and he jumps into that river bad 
courage. Somebody sees a gang, and those gangs, they do evil things and bad things, and if they are caught, they face the ruthless face of the law. And then he says, have courage, and he joins the gang. That one is bad courage, good courage. Know what the Lord has called you to, and know the direction you ought to follow. And then with your heart, with your mind, with your consecration, commitment, everything you have within you, say that is the way. There may be so-called lions in the way. There may be difficulties in the way, but this is the way. And because that is the way, I am going to follow that way. And the Lord will see you through in Jesus' name. Now Joshua had not met all those enemies in Canaan before. Joshua had not met all those confederacies before. But now be of good courage. Good courage that will say, the Lord has called me. And this is what he calls me to. And I will follow that the Lord grant you such courage in Jesus' name. Courage in the inner man. Courage in your spirit. Courage in your soul. That whatever you are hearing, you will not run away from ministry. I will not run away from ministry. Say it aloud. The Lord confirmed that in your life in Jesus' name. And then it says thou must do what you must do the lord reveals that with these people then he says unto the land which the lord has sworn unto their fathers to give them and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. Look at verse 8 there. In verse 8, it tells us, it says in verse 8, it says, and the Lord, he, it is that goes, that doth go before thee. The Lord will go before you. In his power, he'll go before you. In his strength, he'll go before you. In his might, signs and wonders, he'll go before you in Jesus' name. And he said, he will not fail you. Amen. Neither forsake you. Amen. Fear not. Neither be thou dismayed. The Lord is backing you up. He's backing me up. He'll back you up in Jesus' name. And he said, you'll take the people from this point and take them to the land where they will possess. We're looking at verse 8. It says in verse 8, the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He it is that will help thee and be with thee he will not fail thee neither forsake thee he says fear not neither be dismayed look at verse 23 there in verse 23 it tells us and he gave joshua the son of noon a charge and he said be strong again and be of a good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. I was waiting for another amen. Yeah. We need people from sin to salvation. In your preaching, in your ministry, in your exhortation, in everything you do, you bring them from where they are to where they ought to be. We bring them from salvation to sanctification, to that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We don't hammer on salvation, salvation every time, one year, 
two years, five years, ten years, salvation. Yes, salvation is good, but we need to move them on. We're not moving, we're not staying at the Red Sea of a baptism that they went through the river all our life, all our ministry. We are taking them from where they are being to where they ought to be, from salvation to sanctification. We're taking them from sanctification, sanctify them. Through thy truth, thy word is truth. And we're taking them to the power of the Holy Ghost. He shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the uttermost part of the earth. We're taking them from where we meet them and we're taking them to a higher place and to higher ground. And the Lord will give you correct tenacious courage and steadfastness for life and through your life in Jesus name in Joshua chapter 1 I'm looking at verse 6 Joshua chapter 1 and we're looking at verse 6 here is the word of the Lord again to Joshua and here is the word of the Lord for you it says be strong and of a good courage the same word Moses had given him that word be strong and of a good courage and now the Lord himself after calling him is giving him the same word do you know in the life you are living you have a lot of conviction you've read the Bible you've gone to Bible school you've gone to college and you know that this is what you do and you have heard in workers conferences and ministers conferences here is what you do be strong and of a good courage and now the time comes for actually to manifest that courage and that boldness and that steadfastness and the Lord still has to remind you because you know if you leave off hearing that you become weak in your knees will be weak your waist will be weak your mind will be weak and the Lord is still reminding you be strong and of a good courage for unto this people thou shalt divide uh, for an inheritance the land we I swear unto their fathers to give them. And I pray that that courage, the Lord, will instill into every heart of ours in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Point number two now. Point number two, we're looking at the companionship and communion with a trusted mentor. There is Joshua. There is Moses. Moses, a trusted mentor to Joshua. There is Paul. There is Timothy. Paul, a trusted mentor to Timothy. There is Peter and there is Mark. Peter, a trusted mentor unto Mark and in our lives. That's the way it is as we are being trained as we are being taught, as we are moving on in ministry, we need a mentor, a mentor that we trust, a mentor that we know that he will not lead us astray, a mentor that gives us the word, that shows us the way that he himself is walking in the way and is living by what he's teaching us. A mentor who says, do as I say, but don't do as I do. We cannot trust him. A mentor who taught something from the word of God the previous year, and now because of the happiness in life, he changes the message because he's compromising. We cannot trust that, but a person who earnestly, courageously, effectively, wholeheartedly contains for the faith was delivered unto the saints. That's a mentor we can trust. Check out who is your mentor? Who is helping you? Who is leading you? Who is exhorting you? Who is encouraging you? And is saying, this is the way, walk here therein. Is he walking there himself? Is he standing himself? Is he righteous himself? Is he committed to the word of God in heart, in mind, in life, in everything that he does? That 
is the trusted mentor and we need companionship and communion with the trusted mentor. We're looking at this in three perspectives. We're looking at number one, companionship with the mentor without fear. Number two, commitment to mentorship without food and concern for mastery over the fleshly foe. Let's look at number one. Number one here, we're looking at companionship or the mentor without fear. Look at Exodus chapter 24, and I'm reading from verse 13. Exodus chapter 24, we're looking at verse 13, and Moses rose up and his minister Joshua. And Moses went up into the mount of God. When Moses went to the mount of God to receive the law from the Lord, Joshua was with him. It was a fearful sight, a frightening sight. It was like the children of Israel, they told Moses, they said, Moses, this is a frightful sight. This is fearful. Don't allow God to speak to us directly. But you go on here, get there, and then whatever you bring, we will accept. Even Moses himself said in Hebrews, he said, I quit and I feared. And yet, Joshua remained with Moses as he went up to the mountain. You know, there are people that are watching the wind and they are watching circumstances. If things are easy, if things go well, if things are comfortable, then I'll keep on following the mentor. But if things uh, turn around and I see that, you know, the winds are blowing the wrong direction, I don't know whether I can follow or not. But in the case of Joshua, he had that companionship with his mentor without fear. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, it says, And he said unto the elders, he said, Here, tarry ye here for us. Not just for me, for us. Because Joshua was going with him. He says, until we come again unto you. You see, they went, and Moses went to the top of the mountain. Forty days he had not gone back, and Joshua did not abscond. Joshua did not run back. Joshua did not <laughs> look at this man. He let me on this side of the mountain, and he's gone to be now over. I don't know what's happening there. Not at all. That's what you are talking about. That when you have a mentor, when you have a teacher, when you have a coach, when you have a trainer and he's coaching you and he's uh, training you so that you will do what others, ordinary people cannot do and will not do. You abide and you stay with that mentor. It says, tarry for us here until we come again. Behold, Aaron and all are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. Look at verse 15. In verse 15 it says, And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And Joshua was with him all the time. Look at um, Exodus chapter 32. And we're reading from verse 17. Exodus chapter 32, verse 17. 30 day, 40 days have now gone. And Moses was coming back. And guess who he was coming back with? And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise noise of war in the camp. That shows Joshua had not been in the camp. He'd been away for 40 days and Moses did not leave any food for him to eat. He was there. Doesn't this man know that we can get hungry? He's, he's a mentee. He's following the mentor. He remains there. After 40 days and we're coming back, he didn't know that the children of Israel had come down to worship idol. He 
didn't know when they were dancing and singing. He thought it was a noise of war because he had been absent from the crowd. He had been present for the mentor. You'll be absent from the crowd a lot of times. If you're going to have success in ministry, you'll be absent from the crowd a lot of times. If you're going to develop that courage and that stamina and that steadfastness, you'll be with the mentor. You'll be alone a lot of times, alone in prayer, alone in supplication, alone in dependence of the Lord, alone in leaning on the Lord all the time. But if you're always with the crowd, you cannot bear to stand alone, read alone, study alone, pray alone, supplicate alone. You cannot bear to be left alone with the Lord. You will not go too far. If you're a person that is always with the crowd, in the crowd, or the crowd, in the crowd, you'll not amount to too much. But you see this man, he was separate from the crowd, and the Lord empowered him. The Lord will empower you. I said, the Lord will empower you. So you said, there's a noise of war in the camp. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, and he, Moses, said, this is not, it is not the voice. It is not uh, the, uh, the voice of them that shout for mastery. Neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But... The noise of them that sing, do I hear? Because the Lord had told him that the people have gone back and they are said a racing up idol or gods that will lead them back to you but joshua did not know that he was away from the crowd companionship with the mentor without fear look at number two here number two is commitment to mentorship without food commitment to mentorship without food that's what i told you already that joshua was on the side of the mount no food commitment. You know, there are people that say, I keep on following, if we eat at the right time, drink at the right time, sleep at the right time, have all the physical conveniences at the right time, uh, keep on following. But if Moses thinks I'm like him and he doesn't make allowance and any provision for food, for sleep and for water and for conveniences, uh -uh, I am out. I don't take religion with madness. I don't take religion with, you know, insensitivity. I don't take religion or just anything. If the going gets well, I keep on following. If the going gets good, I keep on following. If I have breakfast and lunch and supper the way I want it, then I'll keep on following. But you know, Joshua, a man that has been trained for mastery, a man that has been trained to take the people, millions of people, and take them to the promised land. He had commitment to mentorship even without food. And I pray that the Lord himself will recondition us and repackage us that will have the right attitude at the right time because of the calling the Lord has given us in Jesus' name. Did, he hear, did I hear the amen I wanted? Yes. Amen. Look at number three now. Number three, we're looking at concern for mastery over the fleshly for concern for mastery. Concern for mastery. And look at Exodus chapter 32 again. And I'm reading from verse 17. It says, when... Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted. He said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. Now, Joshua, what did you think of that? Because the first call of Joshua was to go to Amalek and fight with Amalek. And when Moses lifted up the hand of the rod, 
Joshua prevailed. And when the sand went down, Amalek prevailed until Aaron and all stood by his sides and they made the sand steady and he had the mastery in that war. And since that time, he knew it was a preparation for the ministry he was going to have in the land of Canaan, from king to king, from territory to territory, from Jordan to Jericho, and everywhere he was prepared that he will fight the armies in the army of the Lord and they will prevail and every time he had a noise every time something came he said there's war and i'm ready and i'm going now you see when you are called and you know you're for mastery every time you are all the time your heart your mind is for mastery and your plan your pursuit is for mastery that's why moses now said in verse 18 in verse 18 it says and he said it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome and then he said this is what i hear but the point is that joshua was concerned for mastery when we're called as we're called and we're following after the call your dream your desire and your Denial, deny yourself. Everything is focused on mastery. Number one, you want to be have mastery over your flesh so that your flesh does not take over the activity of your soul, of your spirit. You should think of yourself as spirit, soul, body. But many people, majority of people, they think of themselves as body, soul, spirit. And the spirit comes last. And the body, the flesh, has the mastery over them. I feel hungry. Get something to eat. If you don't have, steal it, get it. The flesh wants this now. And that is what they run after. The flesh wants pleasure get it get it directly from a legitimate source if you cannot get it from a legitimate source get it anyhow from an illicit source it doesn't matter because the flesh is number one with them the soul and the spirit will be under those walls they do not have the mastery over the fleshly flow full but the one that has the mastery the spirit is number one and the spirit that prays that supplicates the spirit that receives the devil and receives temptation the spirit has the mastery and then it tells the soul soul pay attention it's not what you feel it's not the emotion so pay attention it is not what you hear so pay attention it's not the heat or the cold the spirit has the mastery and then the flesh comes last that the spirit that's why it says the god of peace sanctify you spirit soul and body until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So make a change and let your spirit now be number one, soul number two, and the flesh number three, so that your body will always be under the control and the power of your spirit. I pray the Lord give us understanding in Jesus' name. First Corinthians chapter 9, and I'm reading from verse 25. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Temperate in all things. Subdued in all things. Controlled in all things. His spirit has gained the ascendancy. His spirit has gained the mastery. And because of that, the body 
will pay attention, will be under control. And then it says, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I. It wasn't fighting man, it was fighting the fleshly foam, the body that will get him back into the, you know, into the dungeon again. He said, not as one that beat the air. Then in verse 27, he says, but I keep my body under. I keep I, my spirit, that's the real me. My spirit is the real me, but he lives in a house called the body, the flesh. And he says, my spirit, the landlord of the house. My spirit, the captain, the champion at home. He says, my spirit, I keep under my body and i bring it to subjection that the body does not contradict destroy the calling that the lord had given me you see there are some people in the body that controls them that destroys the ministry to which they are called but paul the apostle said i the inner man I, the real me, I, my soul, my spirit, I keep the body under and I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I, my real self, I myself should be a cast away. I pray you will not be a cast away. I will not be a cast away. Amen. Look at point number three now. Point number three, we're looking at the conviction and consistency of a transparent model. Again, we're bringing to our mind the life and the calling of Joshua. Joshua, think about this man since we came to know him. In Exodus chapter 17, he has been going on with the children of Israel. He never lived a private, hidden life. Always in the open. Always transparent. There was nothing Joshua was doing that Moses did not know. And when they went to spy out the land, there was nothing Joshua was doing that Caleb and the rest of the people did not know. You see, there are people that have too much of privacy in their lives. And they hide this, they hide this, they hide that. You cannot tell where they are. You cannot tell what they're doing. You cannot tell where they're going. Hey, Pastor so-and-so, where are you? He takes the phone, I am somewhere, where are you? We cannot tell. The man is not transparent. The woman is not transparent. In the case of Joshua, if you're going to be a model, your life must be in the open. There is nothing hidden. There is nothing you are covering up in any way. Are you not a leader? Are you not a model? Aren't you transparent? Shouldn't you be transparent? Now we have the conviction and the consistency of a transparent model. We're looking at three things here. Three points we're looking at. Number one is steadfastly following the Lord despite despite national apostasy. Number two, single-mindedly focused in life detached from national atrocities. Number three, sacrificially fulfilling the labor of love devoted to national assignment. We're coming to number one there. Number one there, we're looking at steadfastly following the Lord despite national apostasy. You know the story. The children of Israel under the leadership of Aaron 
We don't know where this Moses is when he's coming back or what has happened to him up. Make us gods that will go before us. Hey, look at that. Make us God that will go before us. The destination that God had ordained and assigned. Or that God, strange God, or the God of this world cannot take us there. If it is God that has marked out, it is, if it is God that has given us the promise, the promised land, the destination that God himself has ordained, all that God, strange God, the God of this world cannot take us there. They said, make us God that will take us to the place we're going. And in the case of that national apostasy, that they all went away from God, Joshua distinguished himself, separated himself. He will not go on in national apostasy. You will not follow and compromise with apostasy in religion, in Christianity, in Jesus' name. You know, sometimes you find whole denominations backsliding. They've left the Bible and they've gone into apostasy. They do not depend on Christ and Christ alone for salvation. They do not depend on the eternal God, a Father who is in heaven alone. They do not depend upon the power, the power of the Spirit of God alone. They have other gods that will give them power and lead them to the place where God has ordained apostasy. I will not follow the apostates. I will not follow the apostates. You know, it's easy to follow the apostates because those apostates sometimes, if you don't follow their way, they persecute you and they lay some heavy pressure on you. But you say pressure or no pressure, persecution or no persecution, I know that's apostasy. I will not follow apostasy. And the Lord help you and confirm your decision and your consecration in Jesus' name. You know, I'm going to ask for another. Amen. Amen. Steadfastness in following the Lord despite national apostasy. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 21. It says, For even hereunto were ye called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Leaving us an example. Any church, any denomination that forsakes the way of Christ. Christ our Savior. Christ our healer. Christ our sanctifier. Christ our baptizer. And Christ the coming King. Any church, any denomination, any minister that forsakes Christ and then is after other things. That is apostasy. He said Christ has led us an example that ye shall follow his steps. I will follow Christ. In life, will follow Christ. In doctrine, will follow Christ. In lifestyle, will follow Christ. In ministry, will follow Christ in Jesus' name. Look at number two here. Number two is single-mindedly focused in life, detached from national atrocities. The children of Israel, they followed atrocities. Things you could never imagine. They had seen the destruction of idols in Egypt and they had seen all the way that God led them through and yet, look at them, the atrocities that people who backslide that they follow. The atrocities that an Aaron can follow the high priest. The atrocity is that people who are forsaking the way of the Lord, they don't have what we call 
personal devotion anymore. They don't read the Bible regularly anymore. Moses is gone to the mountain. They're not hearing the word of God. They're not ruminating and meditating on the word of God. They're not checking up what we have heard, what we have known, what we have seen, and the things we have committed ourselves to. And now all that will come is atrocity. Think about an Aaron that has heard when I see the blood of the Lamb, I will pass over you. And the Lord said, I'll bring judgment upon the gods of Egypt. And all that judgment had come upon the gods of Egypt and think of such an Aaron going back to their vomits and then making gods that will go before them. You know, if you're going to really serve the Lord, you need to be single-minded and you need to be focused in your understanding Look at the Bible and stay with the Bible and the God of heaven will continue to be with you in Jesus' name. Can I show you something in the Psalms? Look at Psalm 57 and I'm reading from verse 7 there. Psalm 57, we're looking at verse 7. It's talking about my heart is fixed, oh God, my heart is fixed. It says you've called me, you've showed me the way and you've told me that there's the, the way to go. I've committed myself to that. My heart is fixed. Oh God, my heart is fixed. Look at Psalm 108. We're looking at verse 1. Psalm 108, verse 1. Oh God, my heart is fixed. Second time, it says, Oh God, my heart is fixed. When you have the word, when you have Christ, when you have the Savior, when you have his salvation, you have the sanctifier, you have his sanctification, you have the baptizer, you have his baptism, and you have the king, the king of kings, wanting to be your Lord and your king every time, all the days of your life. There's only one thing to say to the Lord, my heart is speaks to God, my heart is fixed. Look at Psalm 112, 112 and we're looking at verse 7 there in Psalm 112, reading from verse 7, it says, they shall not be afraid of evil tidings, of evil, of evil news. His heart is fixed. Trust in the Lord. Trust in, in the Lord. And the psalmist has told us three times over that we need to have focus and be single-minded in life despite what may be happening in other places, despite national atrocities. Let's come to number three now. Number three, we're looking at sacrificially fulfilling the labor of love devoted to national assignments. Sacrificial Surely fulfilling the labor of love. You see, anything we're going to do, it will demand some sacrifice. Why? Because you know, the flesh will not like to follow everything. It's like you have something urgent to do, something important to do, and you set your alarm at a time that is, uh, you know, earlier than you normally wake up. Let's say you wake up normally at 6 o'clock, and then you say, I have something to do today. I set the alarm at 5 o'clock because of what is ahead of me, and because of what I need to do today, and then you put that alarm, the phone, or whatever nearby and uh, you know the alarm strikes off five o'clock and your flesh says do you really want to wake up now? Do you really want to, you know, I've not had enough time. The normal time will wake up is this time. I thought you'll even give me today one hour extra. And then you sit closing your eyes and you stretch your hand and you stop that alarm and you go on. And then the six o'clock, you might wake up, you're about to wake up now and the body said, can I have a few minutes more? Indulges every time. But you know, if you 
they're going to do something, you know, something definite, something remarkable. The thing you know you are called for, it will demand sacrifice. That when that alarm clock rings and the body says, give me some time more, you say, no, don't control the spirit, don't control the soul. You stop that thing, you get up, and then if you need to exercise yourself, if you need to, you know, read some, you know, encouraging words in the word of God and pray, you need to do all that because your heart, your mind is focused on what you are called to do. You need sacrifice if you're going to fulfill your calling. The calling as an evangelist, you need sacrifice. The calling as a pastor, the calling as a teacher of the word, the calling as apostle prophet, you need that sacrifice that you say the body will not be in charge. The body will not be in control. Hunger, thirst, pain, whatever, will not be in control, you get out of what we call the comfort zone, expand that comfort zone. That one wasn't convenient before, that one wasn't comfortable before, I expand that and I make those uncomfortable things become comfortable now because if you're going to achieve anything in ministry, there must be sacrifice, sacrificial fulfillment in the labor of love. You're not roaming about and wasting life and wasting time you are devoted to your national assignment and I pray as you do that the Lord himself will make you an achiever I said you'll be an achiever you will have success you'll have progress and the work of the Lord will prosper in your hand in Jesus name look at Deuteronomy chapter 31 and I'm reading from verse 7 Deuteronomy chapter 31 and we're reading here from verse 7 here is the Lord talking uh, through Moses and he's talking to Joshua again and he says and Moses called unto Joshua and he's calling unto you now and said unto him in the sight of all Israel in the sight of all Israel Moses master mentor minister talk to me privately don't talk to me in the sight of all Israel no I'll talk to you in the sight of all Israel so that when you are derailing they will remind you and say remember what you are told in our presence when you are compromising when the flesh is taking over and when you want to live a easy life an easy life when you want to live a life that is meandering and following the path of the weak will be able to remind you that's why Moses spoke to him in the sight of all Israel and he said unto him he says be strong and of a good courage. Be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with these people unto the land. Go with these people. Moses, did I hear you? This mixed multitude, these people, if you are going this direction, they want to steer you this direction, shouldn't I abandon them and then just go away? No, you have to lead them to the land of promise. You will go with these people and you must learn how to be with them without compromising, how to be with them, leading them that will get to that land, the land which the Lord has sworn unto their fathers to give them and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. That shall cause them, the sinners, to inherit salvation. That shall cause them, the saved, to have sanctification. That shall cause them, the sanctified, to have the power of the Holy Ghost. That shall cause them, the followers of the Lord, to get to that kingdom that Christ had gone to prepare for them. That shall cause them to inherit the promised land, the land of beauty, the land of glory. Glory, heaven is a goal. If you're going to get that happen, you must cause them to have peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. God has called you and he wants you to have courage. And all the courage you need, he'll give unto you. 
And then you go on with conviction, you go on with courage, and you go on with commitment. And then you get to the land and you take the people of God to the land as well in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, I've heard a lot today, and I'm going to allow everything you have taught, everything you have revealed, I'm going to allow that to take place in my life. All the conviction you need, all the courage you need, all the power you need, all the spirit you need, all the commitment and concentration that you need, all the courage, and then you have your soul, your spirit being in charge, being in control of the body, and your body will not lead you astray in the wrong direction anymore. Open your mouth, pray, and the Lord answer your prayer.